Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining um, our first webinar of 2020. My name is Maggie Howell and I'm the Executive Director here at the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, a few items before we get started. If anyone has questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel and we will have a Q&A session after the presentation. Also, a recorded version of the webinar will be available in a day or so uh, and it'll be on the Wolf Conservation Center website. And uh, let's get down to business. So I'm really excited. Today we are joined by Andrew Stein, who has generously offered to discuss his work in exploring the use of scent marks as bio boundaries to foster predator coexistence. Dr. Andrew Stein has studied techniques for promoting human wildlife coexistence for nearly 20 years, primarily in East and Southern Africa. His pioneering work includes the development of an automated lion alert system for villagers in Northern Botswana, um, analysis of the costs and benefits of leopard conservation in Namibia, and now exploring uh, the use of scent marking on wolves in Montana. Uh, Andrew founded the Claws Conservancy, which stands for Communities Living Among Wildlife sustainab Sustainably, <laughs> Uh, to develop and strengthen his vision for non-lethal approaches to mitigating conflict and reducing retaliatory killing of predators. Dr. Stein is also an associate professor of natural sciences at Landmark College in Vermont. So without any further ado, I'll turn the time over now to Andrew. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks so much, Maggie. Uh, I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to share some of our proposed research with everybody uh, from your group. So I'm going to get started. Uh, the, the name of the talk is The Use of Scent Marking to Foster Predator Coexistence. And I'll talk through some of the uh, background of our thinking, some of the challenges uh, that we face uh, moving this technique forward and just some of the things that um, we've had in mind as we develop it uh, into practical use in the field. So uh, one of the reasons why this is such a hot topic is that uh, wolf populations have been increasing uh, over the years. Um, in particular, when they were uh, released in Yellowstone, uh, in the mid uh, 1990s, uh, the populations uh, quickly grew and expanded uh, beyond the boundaries of the park. And as this happened, it started to cause uh, conflict among the ranchers along the boundaries of the park. And then as the wolves continued further afield, uh, more and more ranchers were starting to uh, feel the impacts. Now, of course, uh, wolves had been uh, eliminated about 80 years earlier. So many of the ranching operations uh, no longer had uh, management uh, protocols in place to handle wolves. Uh, as well, the profit margin for many of these ranches uh, was shrinking um, precipitously as uh, ranching activities were more costly, uh, the cost of land uh, increased and therefore property values and uh, property taxes increased. And so profit margins uh, were on a fingernail to begin with. And then with the introduction of wolves, many of the ranchers uh, felt that uh, this was an even greater uh, problem for them to continue their way of life. So uh, people uh, started looking into a variety of different ways to manage uh, the problem. So uh, wolf behavior uh, is fairly well known. Uh, they are territorial. Uh, their range size is dependent on resources that are available. Uh, within this um, ecosystem around Yellowstone, uh, home range sizes for the packs are between 185 and 310 square miles. Uh, wolf packs uh, further north uh, in Alaska where resources are slimmer, the uh, range sizes can be double, triple, quadruple this size. Um, although packs uh, are pretty cohesive, they have a, a fission fusion um, lifestyle whereby members of the pack might split off uh, for days or a couple weeks and then come back together uh, at different times. Uh, so 
uh, they're not always together all the time at the same time. Um, during uh, denning season, which typically starts uh, from April, can last about 10 weeks and they'll stay at the same den site uh, as long as they're not disturbed. Uh, but then as the pups get old enough uh, to be a little bit more mobile, the pack will move and set up shop in what are called rendezvous sites where uh, they'll leave the uh, young pups and they'll go out to hunt and come back and either retrieve the pups and bring them to a kill or bring food back to them. As the pup gets, pups get a little bit older uh, towards the fall, then uh, they become even more mobile and so uh, they use rendezvous sites less and less uh, over that time. So uh, looking at this map here, um, this is from the National Park Service uh, for Yellowstone. You can see uh, this is from uh, 2016, the um, configuration of many of the different uh, pack home ranges. You can see for the most part, uh, there's not a lot of overlap uh, in many of the packs, although in the Northeast, you can see some overlap between some of those packs likely because there's some relatedness between individuals uh, in those packs. So uh, early on, there was a lot of pressure to use uh, lethal uh, predator management. Uh, many of the ranchers didn't want the wolves there to begin with. And so uh, they worked with different uh, state agencies. Uh, depending on those agencies, some were more or less willing to use lethal control when wolves uh, started conflict by, by killing cattle. Now, of course, cattle, even uh, like the elk at the time, were what we call predator naive. So many of the wild prey of wolves were not used to wolves in the area, and so many of their natural defenses uh, were missing. Uh, same thing with the livestock. So. Um, but over time, there's been more and more pressure from different interest groups um, within the state and uh, throughout the country to lobby uh, many of these agencies to try to pioneer non-lethal predator management techniques. Uh, some of the techniques that are being used now uh, are things like range riders, where you have um, people on horseback moving with cattle, uh, making sure that they're uh, moving without uh, conflict from predators and they can spot predators ahead of time. Uh, they'll use things like flagery, which is essentially a rope that has small uh, triangular shaped red flags on it that sort of blow in the wind and wolves tend to avoid those areas that have flagery. Sometimes the flagery is mixed with uh, electric fencing and so when the wolves get zapped a few times when they see the flags, they uh, stay away uh, for short periods of time, sometimes up to a few months. Uh, also, uh, ranchers and managers will use scare devices, uh, things like flashing lights or loud noisemakers. And this typically works on wolves for a short period of time before they become habituated. These are you know, scary noises. They're not used to those noises. Um, but oftentimes, once they get used to them and they see that there's nothing behind the threat, then they will move past and habituate. Another thing that helps uh, on the ranches is uh, the removal of carcasses when livestock die. So having a designated dump site uh, where livestock can be uh, transported away from uh, live livestock actually keep predators away that just want to uh, find a quick and easy meal. So, um, but what we're proposing is the use of scent marks. Um, wolves, like many territorial species, uh, will maintain exclusive use of large portions of their home range. These are called the territories. And wolves will uh, use territorial cues to make sure that they have exclusive use. Um, if these territories are 300 square miles or more, it can be really difficult for wolves to patrol those areas on a regular basis to scare out uh, neighbors or potential intruders. 
So they'll use different types of territorial cues, including urination, um, leaving scats or feces. Uh, they'll use scrapes, so they'll scrape their hind legs uh, in the ground or in the snow as a, uh, as a visual marker. Uh, and of course, they also howl. Not, now these, um, these different cues are used not only for territoriality, but for group cohesion as the pack separates and then comes together uh, at different times. They'll listen for the howls of the members of their pack in order to uh, fix a direction and then meet up with them at a rendezvous site or den site. So urination, uh, when it happens, uh, different wolves will exhibit different types of behavior. And depending on where in the territory they are, they may also expel uh, from their anal glands. Uh, the dominant male will raise his leg. Uh, subordinate animals will typically squat, even the males. And then males and females will overmark. So uh, females will typically squat, and then the males, the dominant male, will overmark that female. And there can be a blending of the hormones that are present in the uh, urination that mix and, and provide a particular uh, kind of message. Now the idea for using uh, scent marks um, as a non-lethal technique for reducing conflict uh, is not a brand new one. Um, there have been a few studies that have looked at uh, territorial scent marking uh, in African wild dogs in Botswana, and then there was one uh, on wolves in Idaho. Um, now, of course, the, the premise of this is that if wolves or wild dogs or other territorial species maintain exclusive use of an area and they uh, maintain that exclusive use by placing scent, they're actually communicating with their neighbors not to, uh, not to uh, move into that area, that the area is already occupied and that uh, there is strength within that pack. Now we don't know all of the messages that are being transmitted with the scent marks, uh, it's actually uh, quite a complicated language uh, that we're trying to replicate. But knowing uh, what we know about domestic dogs and how they can be trained, uh, they can tell the difference between species, but they can also tell the difference between individuals within species. Uh, and with domestic dogs, uh, their life really isn't on the line. Their territorial uh, dominance isn't on the line. So the stakes aren't as high. So um, we would imagine that wolves actually have more at stake. So it's more important that they understand the message that's being transmitted. Now, based on this, we, we would know that wolves can clearly tell the difference between males and females they can likely tell the difference between wolves of different age classes, whether they're very young pups uh, that have a certain hor hormone profile, uh, subordinates, um, uh, wolves that are in their prime, and then also wolves that are um, at an older age uh, that may have a different hormone profile than even the youngsters or the prime age individuals. We also know from uh, lion studies that have occurred in East Africa in the past that lions will actually use roars that they hear from neighboring lions to determine whether to approach uh, an intruder or whether to back away. So I wouldn't say that they can necessarily count the total number of individuals, but they know the difference between one, two, and many. And so based on that numbers game and the strength, they make a calculation as to whether to approach or not. With the African wild dog work, it was done by the Predator, Botswana Predator Conservation Trust, which is run by Dr. Tico McNutt. And through his uh, pioneering work, they collected scent marks from African wild dogs near Marami Game Reserve uh, at the edge of the Okavango Delta. And then they transported these marks to a uh, game reserve in, in eastern Botswana, which was several hundred miles away. And they placed these marks um, and they spaced them around the northern boundary of that game reserve where there was no fence. And then they released a pack of wild dogs into that area. 
under which the dogs met that bio uh, boundary and then started marking along the internal boundary of it, uh, demarcating their own territory and stayed within it for several months. After a little while, the, uh, the dogs started testing the boundary a little bit and then some of the younger pups would actually uh, break through, um, at which point researchers in, in Mashatu Game Reserve would actually um, would actually find the dogs using GPS collars, uh, put out a new batch of scent, and then the dog, then the wild dogs actually ran straight back to their previous territory. Uh, collaborating with uh, Dr. McNutt is Dr. Peter Apps, who's who runs a biochemistry lab in Mount Botswana, where they're looking at the uh, chemical compositions of the scent marks to determine what are the uh, key components and messages uh, chemically within the scent marks. And they're focusing uh, almost entirely on, on the urine as opposed to feces. Now, Dave Osband, when he worked in Idaho, he worked on wolves. He had uh, GPS collared wolves in that area, uh, determine uh, their territory size, and then uh, place scent marks from wolves uh, from non-adjacent areas that he had collected during the winter. So he went out along trails he knew wolves used uh, with a sled. He collected the scent. Uh, he collected feces. He collected uh, scent from wolves in captive facilities and then brought those out um, to the wolves in Idaho where he put the scent out. Within the first year, he actually got a, a pretty strong result. He was able to push wolves off of uh, their own boundary within their own territory uh, for a number of months, up to uh, almost a year. Uh, the second year, uh, it was a little bit more challenging and the wolves started getting wise to the scent. So um, considering the two studies, um, I think there's a lot of potential uh, to explore it further. And I used to actually work with uh, Dr. McNutt in Botswana uh, for three years. Uh, so I know that project quite well, and I've corresponded with Dr. Osband uh, pretty substantially about the setup of his study. Uh, but there are a few things that I'd like to, um, I'd like to play with based on uh, what's been done in the past, the results that they've got, and how I think we might be able to even perfect that design. So, putting the scent marks out um, can be a real challenge. Uh, first of all, we're using a communication system, but we don't know exactly what we're saying. Uh, wolves may use different types of scent marks and release different hormones depending on where they are in their territory, whether they're um, at the boundary or whether they're in the interior. Uh, there might be different uh, scents depending on season. Uh, of course, during the winter, um, they have higher fat content and that might be transmitted into the scent. So using scents from the winter during the summer might actually uh, give a message that might be confusing to wild wolves. Um, uh, then uh, the different types of data collection that we wanna use are, are the satellite tracking collars, putting uh, trail cams up where we put the scent marks out uh, to see how wolves uh, interact with the senses as we put them uh, out into the field. Now, one of the things that we've, um, we've been trying to determine is uh, whether to use captive scents versus wild wolf scents. And some of the challenges there uh, are related to diet. So wolves in captivity, if they're fed, uh, you know, some type of processed dog food versus wild, uh, wildly available prey that might influence uh, the hormones that are present uh, in their uh, scent marks. Um, then if they're not exercising as much or they're, they're stressed because uh, they're inter interacting with visitors on a regular basis, that might also influence uh, the hormone profiles within the sense and thereby uh, influence how wild wolves interact with that scent. So our preference is to work with the scent from wild wolves. 
Now, uh, we've tried a few different things, try to collect scent, and uh, the Wolf Conservation Center has graciously uh, helped us collect some of the initial samples that we wanted to use. Uh, we've tried a variety of different things uh, to collect scent. This is uh, one, of the, one of the ideas I had, which was basically putting a, a large piece of sheet metal, which was three feet by three feet, and I curved up the bottom edge, and uh, there's a, a collecting jar at the bottom right uh, that you can see. The idea was that wolves in captivity will typically scent mark on, on new things, new stimuli that are in their environment. Generally, wolves in the wild uh, will do this as well. Uh, they'll walk along roads, and if there's a rock or a stump, um, so there's a visual component to where they scent mark. So we put these, um, these collection uh, stations in the uh, enclosure, and this is what the wolves did to them. Now you can see they're very curious. Um, they'll even sniff around them at first. Uh, they'll bite a little bit around the fence. I think even the reflection of the they could see some like muddled reflection uh, on, the, um, on the stainless seal, but none of the wolves actually marked them. Uh, they even marked uh, the rock uh, to the right, just next to the station. So we knew that this wasn't gonna work um, for our purposes. So uh, working with uh, the Wolf Conservation Center during uh, the uh, semen collection for uh, IVF, uh, they had to drain the bladders. Uh, so they'd catheterize the wolves and then they would uh, collect urine directly from the bladder, uh, store it in glass jars and freeze it. And then we uh, took those samples. And there were over 50 samples that were collected over the course of a couple years. Now these samples, uh, as we collected them, were frozen, um, had the date, um, had the ID uh, number for the wolves. You can see uh, a little bit uh, on these samples that some of them have a lot more uh, urine in them. Some of them are a little bit more opaque. So there's a little bit more water from saline solution that was uh, flushing the bladder that allowed for them to uh, collect the sample. But instead of using these in the field, um, we decided to collaborate with uh, colleagues from the biochemistry lab at UMass Amherst. So I took these samples, I worked with uh, students uh, who then took those samples and put them into small glass jars uh, that could be used at the uh, mass spectrometry uh, core facility at UMass. And my uh, collaborator, Steve Ailes, uh, is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Now we put those smaller uh, samples into um, a glass uh, chromatography uh, device that actually took some of the uh, gas vapors that were emitted from the samples and then did a reading to determine uh, what were the primary uh, compounds that were in the sample. Uh, now, one of the challenges, and um, Dr. Ailes mentioned this when we first started our collaboration, is that there may be thousands of compounds that are present. Uh, it's not so easy just to pull one or two, um, one or two uh, compounds and, and say that we're good. It may be that it's one compound that's dominant that makes a difference. It might be the combination of a few, or it might be the combination of many. Uh, maybe all 5,000 of those compounds are essential, uh, even the trace elements that are present. Also, understanding that when these samples are released in the field, um, when they interact with sunlight or the cold, right, it may uh, trigger the release of certain compounds uh, at a greater rate. Uh, maybe the way they interact with soil might influence it. Uh, the overmarking of different individuals as well. So what we realized very quickly is that it's very complex. But um, as we're getting the readings out from these samples, we're starting to get a, a sense of which compounds might be uh, most prevalent and thereby most important 
and we might be able to test this in the field. Now the idea in the long term would be able to synthesize um, the primary compounds that make up uh, the territorial signal so that we're not reliant on uh, pulling samples from captive wolves um, during operations and so forth. Uh, that would be uh, the long-term um, benefit that we might be able to get a synthesized uh, compound that we can give to ranchers, they can spray on fence posts around their property, and that might be enough to keep wolves away for the short, short term or potentially long term. So what, what we're thinking about instead for collecting samples from wild wolves, and I've been talking to uh, wolf biologists in Montana uh, that gave me the idea, is to go to uh, roadkill um, carcass dumps in, in Montana. The Department of, of Transportation will clear the roads of any roadkill that occur. They bring them to dump sites and wolves, grizzly bears, and other predators uh, will scavenge at those sites. They'll scent mark um, because they want to protect uh, their food resource. And especially in the winter, if you go there and you follow the tracks and you find the yellow snow, you can easily collect uh, quite a few samples. So that's uh, one of the directions that we're planning to go um, this season. And that way we're not dependent on uh, captive wolves uh, for collecting the scent. So deploying the scent marks is a whole other challenge. Uh, and we have a proposed setup that I'll, I'll go through now, um, but it requires uh, quite a number of samples on a regular basis. Uh, if we're gonna be uh, projecting an artificial territory of wolves, uh, we wanna make sure that we're um, replacing these scents on a regular basis um, between two and three weeks. Uh, just to make sure that the sample is refreshed so any potentially intruding wolves know that a wolf had traversed that area um, recently. And we'll talk a little bit about the types of uh, analysis that we want to do. So here's the uh, proposed setup. So here's you know, a very basic scheme of what the uh, territory of the wolf looks like. So we'll spread the scent marks uh, at stations at about 300 meters apart. Uh, we'll do it along alternating lines uh, so, so that there's not just one line of scent marks, but a couple. So if wolves move in between uh, two of those scents in one line, they're likely to hit uh, the scent on another line. Uh, there'll be multiple marks per station. So we want to make sure that it's not just one scent mark per station, but three or more wolves are represented at each place. We want to re replenish the marks every two to three weeks. Um, and we will choose sites uh, with known collared wolves so that uh, when the wolves approach, uh, we will actually be able to determine when they hit that scent marking line, uh, that biofence, but also if they pass through it. Now, of course, the, with this type of calculation, that would require 54 marks per month uh, over a two mile stretch. Now, in some cases, we would want to do more than two miles. Uh, in other cases, two miles might be just enough, uh, especially around a, uh, a calving site um, along a, within a ranch where we want to just protect that small area for a short period of time. But as you can imagine, uh, collecting 54 cent marks per month from a captive facility is going to be really difficult, especially since if we're mimicking a wild wolf pack. We don't want to mix scents from multiple packs from multiple facilities. We want to have one dominant pair with subordinates like a, like a normal pack. If we were collecting scents from multiple packs from multiple places, then there might be scents from two dominant males, two dominant females, different subordinates. And that may actually confound the message that we're trying to uh, represent. And I think that was one of the challenges that uh, was present in the, in the project in Botswana where we were collecting scents from multiple uh, wild dog packs and mixing them together and putting them along a scent line, as well as uh, Dave Osman's work where um, he was collecting scent from wild wolves, mixing it with some captive wolves to kind of have a mix uh, match 
pack. Um, so I think that that's one way that we might, if we're able to get scent marks on a regular basis from one pack, uh, we may be able to replicate that as best as possible. Uh, using um, packs that have individuals with satellite collars is going to be essential. So using those satellite collars, we can track when the wolves encounter scent marks and, or move beyond the bio uh, fence. And that way we'll know if the bio fence is working or whether we need to put scent clo more closely together instead of 300 meters, maybe 150 meters apart. Uh, instead of two or three weeks, maybe it's one to two weeks that we put the scents out. Instead of three cents per station, maybe we put out four or five. Now, of course, that's going to uh, make it a lot more challenging for collecting the scent to deploy it. But um, especially when we're investigating a new technique, you have to really uh, try a few different types of approaches to see what you get. Now, again, this is what we hope it would look like uh, with the wolves having these uh, satellite collars. We should be able to determine when they approach and when they back off. One of the things that we've noticed uh, from conversations with a number of people that study wolves or trap wolves is that they say scent marks actually attract wolves. And so they don't think that it would work. Uh, but what I would argue is that we want these scents to attract wolves. We're actually trying to communicate with wild wolves. And if they don't approach the scent marks, then they're not gonna get the message we're trying to deliver and they're not gonna back off. Um, and so because wolves have evolved to, uh, to find these marks, to interpret what's being said, and then to act upon that information, we want to make sure that, they're, that this message is being delivered. So in conclusion, um, wolves maintain exclusive use of territories. Uh, and so because of this, uh, they want to uh, communicate their presence within these uh, exclusive territories. They're so big that they can't actually uh, defend them all the time with uh, physical conflict. In fact, wolves will typically try to avoid deadly conflict uh, through these territorial cues. So if they can share information with their neighbors enough that the neighbors back off, all the better for both packs of wolves. Various humans have created deterrence um, that work for short periods. Um, using these flashing lights and noisemakers are great. Even the flagery works uh, quite well uh, for several months. But wolves have evolved to understand this system of communication. And if we can crack the code, then we should be able to have a long-term, um, potentially a long-term uh, non-lethal solution that's based on uh, natural behavioral deterrence. So we propose using natural, non-lethal uh, scent marking as a deterrent to promote coexistence. So with that, um, I want to thank uh, all of you for, for listening. Um, the Wolf Conservation Center for not only collaborating with me on some of the earlier trials for, for collecting scent from the wolves and having samples to uh, analyze uh, with the biochemistry lab, um, but also uh, putting up this uh, webinar so that we can communicate and share ideas. Uh, I want to thank uh, UMass Amherst Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, specifically Dr. Steve Ailes, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, uh, because there are several uh, wolf biologists and uh, collaborators that have been uh, discussing these ideas with in the past and we're building uh, towards a, uh, a proper field test in the near future. And then Landmark College, uh, where I work that has provided uh, small grant money for us to investigate uh, small aspects of the project and will help us develop these ideas going forward. So for those of you interested in following us, we have a website, www.clausconservancy.org or on Instagram at uh, Claus Conservancy. And we have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash Claus Conservancy. So any of you uh, interested in, in learning more about what we do, not only with wolves, but with our lion project and the alert system we're developing there, uh, or some of the other projects that we're involved with, come check us out and uh, yeah, drop us a line. 
So with that, um, I'll stop the presentation and, and we can get to some questions. All right, well, Andrew, thank you so much. Um, I especially enjoyed watching our mischievous um, Mexican gray wolves dismantling your urine collection <laughs> uh, apparatus. But um, everyone, we'll go ahead and take some time for questions now. Uh, for those of you who joined um, after the introduction, we're here with Andrew Stein, who just finished his presentation on the use of scent marks as bio boundaries to foster predator coexistence. And for those who still have questions, um, please be sure to type them uh, in our Q&A box in the control panel at the bottom of your computer. Okay, so here's the first question. Um, oh, this one's kind of a simple one. Um, what is the size of a typical wolf urine sample? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Actually, it varies a lot. Um, when, uh, it, if you have a, a pet dog, um, when you take the dog out in the morning uh, for its morning pee, uh, usually the first one um, has a lot of volume to it. But as you walk around the neighborhood and the dog sniffs a little bit, uh, they might overmark or urinate uh, later on and it gets less and less and less. Um, usually it's, I'd say maybe five to 10 uh, milliliters of urine, um, but it can vary and uh, so when we're putting out scents, I think we're going to go, you know, medium to low end of that, uh, just so that we can space out the scents as much as possible. Um, but yeah, and that is one of the tricky things is understanding that as they scent mark along their, along their boundary, uh, it gets less and less. So it's not a, a clear uh, answer all the time. Makes sense. Um, so you talked a lot about the, um, the uh, studies done in Idaho, and we actually had some people um, watching that were very closely uh, tied to uh, those projects and those studies. And a question, what, what, are there any in broad strokes big differences between um, the study that you're kind of mapped out for us um, and the one that was done in Idaho? Um, good question. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I have been talking to uh, Dr. Dave Osban uh, quite a bit, especially in the uh, early consideration of this project. And I think he did a great job. Um, so uh, some of the results he got are, were really pioneering in understanding how scent marks might be used to manipulate wolf movement. And one of the really interesting differences between what he did and what, what Tico did in Botswana was that the wolves already had established territories. So he was actually moving them off into the interior of their own territory by using scent marks, which is something I didn't know uh, was possible. Um, so, that, so that was quite interesting. Some of the differences that I see that I would like to try, uh, first of all, is that um, you know, Dave used scent marks uh, as he found them as best he could. So he would collect some scent marks um, moving along uh, territorial boundaries like in the snow and he'd scoop up that snow. And then he would take scent marks from captive wolves that were, you know, a different group altogether. He'd mix those samples and then, then put them out. And what, what I'm hoping to do is make sure that we're using consistent samples from, from the same pack or neighboring packs so that uh, there isn't um, a confusing message between the individual scents that we're putting out. Um, Dave used feces quite a bit um, because they're easier to collect and they're easier to see, especially when you get away from the winter and it's springtime and there's no snow. Um, and then he also had a, uh, had a, a hind foot of a, a wolf. Uh, so I think there was one that, that had been killed and the state had confiscated. And so he was able to use that hind foot, foot and do a, a drag mark. Um, and I don't have access to that. So those are a few of the differences. Um, but I, I talked to Dave about the, uh, the planning and uh, try to get his input as much as possible. Um, so uh, just to 
try to make sure that uh, I'm not making big mistakes that were things that he, uh, he found out early on in his work. Well, thank you. Um, here's another question. Does the potency of the scent decrease with age? Uh, so I assume he means age of the scent um, versus age of the animal. Um, because I, I would think that uh, the potency of the scent would be the same across uh, the different animals, uh, regardless of age. I think the hormone profile might be different. Um, obviously, uh, some of the first urinations of the day are going to have a lot more uh, material in them aside from water and urea. Um, but over time, I would imagine that they do have a uh, uh, reduce their potency, you know, so as they dry up, depending on the season, uh, if, if it's dry, the scent marks might dry up really quickly and then the scent isn't as strong. Um, if it's wet season uh, it, or there are rainstorms, it might wash away quickly. Uh, one of the interesting things, of course, with working with wolves or other canids is that their sense of smell is so strong that even if you get on your hands and knees and sniff the ground, um, you may not smell something, but they do. Uh, so the potency, I think, remains uh, far longer than we expect. Uh, but you know, we're, we would try to hedge our bets when putting the scent out as much as possible. Um, but I think it, it varies with season. It varies with uh, how often the scent is, is placed out. Uh, I will say that um, in Botswana, um, we were able to find that some of the wild dogs would visit some of the scent stations months after the scent was left and wasn't replenished. So uh, I think they last a lot longer than, than we think. Thank you. Um, okay, your research is on gray wolves in the lower 48 United States based on circumstances with livestock operators in the Northern Rockies. Are you in conversation with researchers in other countries which have wolves that may be researching the same issue or may be interested in conducting parallel research with wolves in, for instance, Spain, Portugal, India, or elsewhere? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I've been in email contact with a few people, though it hasn't um, developed into a full-blown full collaboration at this point. Um, I think whenever anybody proposes a new type of idea, though, of course, uh, Tico and, and Dave Osban uh, had done some trials in the past, uh, I think it piques a lot of interest uh, among various people within the field. So uh, I'd be very open to working with anybody anywhere that's interested in, in trying to play with the idea. Uh, there are a lot of people, even within the lower 48, I know. Um, State biologists in Oregon have played with scent for a short period of time and, you know, had mixed results. Um, you know, so, so there, there's even plenty of people within this country that uh, would be open to it. And I'd love to talk to people in the Southwest as well. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm very open. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear their impressions or some of their, um, some of their input into how to perfect it and make it better. Oops, sorry, I was on mute. Um, do wolves have a hormonal component in scent marking to express um, different messages like warning, fear, uh, and the like? Yeah, so uh, we know from um, studies in endocrinology where, where you're looking at uh, presence of hormones that, that it does vary. Uh, it can vary a lot. Uh, and that's why. Um, it, I mentioned early in the presentation that um, the scent marks that are released uh, at the interior of the territory may, uh, may have a different message than those at the outer edge of the territory. Uh, wolves that are in uh, hostile ranch lands where you know, they're likely to come into conflict with people, they may have a different hormone profile than those uh, safely in the Mar Lamar Valley of Yellowstone. 
Uh, so those are, are things that you need to need to consider um, when putting the scent out. Um, another thing that's been interesting in talking to Peter Apps, who's analyzing the wild dog scent uh, samples in Botswana. Now these wild dogs are in a essentially a protected area. It's a wildlife management area where uh, no livestock are allowed and you know the wolves are relatively safe. Uh, he's analyzed hundreds of samples even from the same wolves and depending on the sample he may have completely different results as to what hormones are present. So quickly when you start digging into this technique you realize that there's a lot of complexity to this language. It's not just one or two words like, you know, uh, danger or I'm ready to mate. There's a lot of nuance to the messaging. And, um, and if we're playing with this message, if we're, if we're reading a message out loud to these wolves, we have to make sure that we understand the context under which the scent was left. Otherwise, we might be saying something that we don't want to be saying. And so, um, yeah, those differences in, in hormones are, are very real and, and need to be considered. That's great. Um, there are a few questions, people wondering um, if livestock grower community has been uh, receptive or supportive of your work. Um, it, it's, it's been mixed. Um, not that people are, are necessarily entirely against it. I think, um, I think like most people, they're skeptical of, of new things, uh, especially when a lot of the people that, that trap for wolves will say, well, I use scent marks to attract the wolves to my traps. So why would I use it to, as a deterrent? That doesn't make sense. So, so talking through exactly why I think it's important that the wolves interact with the scent so that they get the message, so that they can interpret it and then, then move off. Um, having that conversation, I think, is, uh, is really helpful. And then uh, some ranchers say, well, well, good luck with that. You know, uh, I'll be interested to hear what happens in a year or two. And then other ranchers, uh, I just got an email from, um, a rancher uh, two weeks ago, uh, just outside of Bo Bozeman, and she said, you know, I'm really interested in hearing more about this, uh, even for grizzly bears. Um, so let's have a conversation. Maybe you can come out to my place and, and we can experiment with it a little bit. So, so it's mixed, but I don't, I think a lot of people are interested in finding a solution, um, something that, that's going to benefit them, um, that's not going to cost very much, that's going to you know, help them uh, with their operation. And uh, not everybody wants to wipe out all the wolves. Um, many of the ranchers are, are, would be fine with them as long as it didn't cost them anything. So, so it's mixed. Makes sense. Um, has it been considered uh, to use scent boundary technology to maintain wolves in protected areas? At this point, not yet. Um, and that, that would be uh, something interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with Doug Smith on the phone uh, about that idea. And of course, he's uh, heading up the Yellowstone Wolf program. And, uh, you know, when the wolves go beyond the boundary of Yellowstone, that's when they get into trouble. And many of the packs don't know, okay, this is the edge of Yellowstone, I should, I should stay here, um, you know, because there aren't fences uh, or, or physical boundaries. So um, what he said, especially for, from his perspective, uh, was that, you know, he doesn't want to use scent marking inside the park. Now, if the ranchers along the boundary of the park were interested, you know, he, he couldn't stop people from, from using it to see if it would deter wolves from leaving. So there may be uh, opportunities there. And I will say um, the wild dog project in, in Botswana, uh, in the Thule block uh, that I spoke about earlier, that's exactly what the scent marks were for. Uh, 
were actually to put marks around the northern boundary of that game reserve that wasn't fenced to keep the wild dogs in. And it worked for, for quite a while. Uh, and even when the wolves, or even when the wild dogs left, as I mentioned, you could, you could find them and blast them with scent, just putting scent uh, upwind of them. And uh, once they detected it, they ran straight back to their territory because they thought, you know, one, one of these other wolf, wolf packs was nearby and they were gonna get beaten up. Um, so I, I think there is definitely potential there as well. That's really cool. Um, so there are oh, more questions. I can't even keep up with all these questions, Andrew, um, which is great. Uh, I'm rather new to this and live in New York City. I was wondering how and if scent marking would help wolves that have just wandered outside of big city areas. Um, we've had a few uh, sightings in cities around the country um, wondering what can be done or how to help them get around safer? Um, I think uh, depending on the context, um, there could be potential. I think a lot of times when wildlife wander, and depending, I, I don't know this exact circumstance, but if they move, move into the city somewhere, uh, it may be challenging for them to find their way out. Um, you know, never mind, uh, navigating their way back to their territory. Um, typically when, when animals are dispersing or moving beyond the boundaries of their territory, uh, they'll be a lot more timid. Uh, they're not, you know, they're, they're trying to avoid confrontation because they don't know the area. It's not their, their home range. So whenever that occurs, whenever an animal's in a new place, um, if they encounter scent marks, then they're going to be more on edge and, and less likely to want to push forward because they're, they're um, likely interpreting that there's another pack around and they, they got to watch their step. Uh, they don't know the place very well. They don't know where the resources are. They don't know how big this pack is. So they, um, they got to be careful. Um, so I would think that it, it could have some potential uh, as long as that animal has has a clear escape route where it can find its way back into a safer area away from people. Excellent. Well, everyone, um, there's just too many others. So I think the best thing to do is to uh, really direct people to all the ways that they can communicate with you. Um, but before I do that, uh, is there anything else you would like to add, Andrew, before we wrap things up? Um, I just want to uh, thank uh, Wolf Conservation Center again um, for collaborating with us, especially in the early phases. Uh, it's really, really difficult to find facilities that can help collect scent. Uh, usually, I, I think I contacted like 20 or 30 facilities, and either the wolves were spayed or neutered, uh, so that obviously uh, introduces some challenges um, to the hormone profiles or the enclosures just aren't set up in a way that that's helpful. So um, partnering with the Wolf Conservation Center has been been great. Um, and just uh, having an opportunity to share this information uh, with many of the people that uh, follow your organization has been great. And I look forward to kind of having more and deeper conversations uh, with people that are generally interested or, or, you know, people that may have wolves on their property that might want to try something new. Um, so yeah, um, I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you for really sharing all of your work. Um, we appreciate you, Andrew. And uh, I guess I have to do a shout out. We appreciate all of those wolves who, you know, unknowingly <laughs> contributed to to uh, your research. So thank you, thank you, wolves. Um, so to everyone else, I just really encourage everyone to explore the Claws Conservancy website at www.clawsconservancy.org to learn more about Andrew's work. And you can also find um, Claws Conservancy on Facebook and Instagram. And, uh, and also just mark your calendars. Our next webinar will be uh, coming up soon, actually on Friday 26th with Tom Gable of the Voyages Wolf Project 
and he's going to discuss the wolves of Voyagers National Park and how they're mastering the art of hunting beavers. Wow. So uh, you can find more information uh, and registration uh, for that webinar on our special events page at the Wolf Conservation Center website at www.nywolf.org. And again, Andrew, thank you uh, for, for being here tonight. I uh, really like the way you're thinking about communication and not just uh, deterrent uh, or, con or, I guess, fear. Um, I think that's an interesting approach and, uh, and it's gotten my wheels turning. So thanks and everyone else, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I hope you can join us again in two weeks. Good night, everybody. Thank you.